Welcome to The Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're looking at Silent Night, Deadly Night 4, Initiation, released direct-to-video in 1990. Initiation has absolutely nothing to do with the previous three movies, completely foregoing the Billy Ricky Chapman Caldwell story, and instead switching gears to a, uh, witch coven that uses lots of bugs? What? This movie is literally the season of the witch of the Silent Night, Deadly Night franchise. Initiation was directed and co-written by Brian Yu who produced the cult classic Reanimator and directed a ton of other films in the genre, including Society, the Reanimator sequels, and one of my favorites as a kid, The Dentist. And don't worry, all of those movies will get covered on this show at some point. In fact, part of the reason Initiation is so random is that Yuzna and co-writer Woody Keith recycled some unused ideas from their creepy body horror Society and stuck them in here. Also joining them from Society was effects artist Screaming Mad George, the credited name of Joji Tani, who gave us that awesome some nasty cockroach scene back in Dream Master. He's, uh, really good at bug stuff, as you'll see. Although this movie doesn't really belong in this franchise, seeing as there are only two scenes that even mention Christmas, I'm kind of into it. It's weird and ambitious, and it's got Clint Howard running around as a dirty henchman. And who doesn't love Clint Howard? Merry Christmas. But Initiation is also pretty messy when it comes to its themes, clumsily tackling gender and sex without ever really making any kind of cogent point. In fact, one last note before we get started here. This movie explores the issues of women in the workplace and feminism in general, and the villains end up being a group of misandrist witches who hate men and try to convert the protagonist played by Neith Hunter to their cause. Now, I don't want to see douchey comments saying that all feminists are man-hating like the witches in this movie, because, and this may blow your mind, Silent Night, Deadly Night 4 does not accurately portray all feminists. It's just like how Get Out didn't accurately portray all white people, and the Purge series doesn't accurately portray all Republicans. These kinds of movies are just like thought experiments, and initiation in particular looks at how a person with legitimate grievances can be taken advantage of by a nefarious group for their own purposes. Okay, we cool? Great, let's finally get to the kills. The movie begins in Los Angeles, where Clint Howard finds some sweet street meat. Fucking A, burger, burger. His cheeseless buggy burger munching gets interrupted by the sight of a woman on a rooftop who suddenly erupts into flames and then falls to the ground to her death. Wait, wasn't she on fire? Oh, okay, it's just her midsection that's aflame? That's cool, I guess. And as Clint checks it out, we see that she's been charbroiled a bit past well done. Sooty. That intro kill leads us into a title card, followed by some opening credits that are similar in style to reanimators, which also means that they're similar in style to a Hitchcock film. I do like the part where it looks like an electric stovetop, though. That's kind of Fun. A report about the falling burning lady is on a TV in a motel room where a couple of journalists are taking turns scooping each other, if you get my meaning. Hey ya! The lady journalist, sporting a real 90s baggy beige pantsuit, is Kim, our heroine played by Neith Hunter, and her leather jacket clad snogging partner there is Hank. They're currently co workers at the LAI, a fictional Los Angeles newspaper. Kim just works on the paper's calendar, but she wants to branch out into journalism with a story about that burnt up lady, which, like, should they be showing that on TV? Their boss Eli, played by Phantasm's Reggie Bannister, is dismissive of Kim, just like all the other dudes in the office. And although it's Kim who has the idea of covering the falling fiery death in the paper, Eli gives the story to Hank, and the two of them immediately start boofing up the eventual headline. Spontaneous combustion. The devil's triangle. Kim tries to lean in and get the assignment herself, but Eli shuts her out of the room. Uh, could you make some fresh coffee, please? Thanks. Upset, Kim commiserates with her co-worker Janice, played by Alice Beasley, who, for a very on-theme fun fact, played the woke-as-fuck teacher in Recess, Miss Grokey. Boys will be boys. Let's read about how the barbaric Europeans stole this country from the Native Americans. Janice helps Kim out by discreetly giving her a paper with some info about the case of the falling flaming lady. Kim checks out the crime scene and talks to an Asian butcher shop owner who speaks in a very forced broken accent and karate chops vending machines. Yeah. She also goes into a bookstore that's near the half-burnt chalk outline of the victim's body, and there she gets creeped on by Clint Howard, who does something with his fingers against her butt that results in a magic sound effect. Get away from me! Leave me alone! What you doing to her butt there, Clint? Turns out his name is actually Ricky, which we learn when the bookstore owner Fema shoes him away. 
He really ought to be institutionalized. Yeah, I'm still not sure if he's supposed to be Ricky Chapman slash Caldwell, or if it's just a lame reference to those first three movies. These last two films in the series are really weird, alright? The ladies introduce themselves to each other with an uncomfortably long handshake, and holy shit, FEMA's played by Maude Adams. That's fucking octopusy right there. Kim purchases a book about spontaneous combustion, number one fear of five to ten year olds everywhere, then gets offered a nasty dried fruit to eat, number one fear of 18 to 35 year olds. Ew, and she eats it? I'm being told it's a dry date by Zorin, one of my editors, but that looks way too much like Dookie to be putting in your mouth all willy-nilly. Yeah, spit that shit out, Kim. Before she leaves, Fima invites Kim to a picnic and gives her a book about Isis. The Egyptian god, not the fuckhead terrorists. Fuck Isis, man. Oh, and the book was on sale, too. It only cost Kim one head smooch. Mwah. Fima lets Kim upstairs, where mold spots look like faces, and the rooftop view places this building, eh, I don't know, somewhere in Thai Town, I think? Maybe Los Feliz? And don't come at me with the Los Feliz shit, okay? Learn Spanish. Kim gets compelled to the edge of the roof and has some kind of dizzy spell before Ricky comes out of nowhere and sticks his hand down a ventilation pipe. As bugs crawl over Kim, and, like, everything, Ricky pulls out one of Mad George's nasty creations. I got this for you, Kim. Merry Christmas. Oh, no go? Maybe she already has one of those, Rick. Hope you kept the receipt. At home, Kim finds herself the victim of all sorts of weird shit. There are bugs in her sink, apparent symbolism of woman power in her spaghetti, and faces in her, uh, I, I don't know, her spread, I guess? To get away from her buggy apartment, Kim heads over to Hank's family's house, where she's offered more weird stuff to put in her mouth. God forbid you say no, Kim. Hank is chilling there, looking like a backup host for Sprockets, and with him is his little brother Lonnie, played by director Brian Yuzna's son, Conan Yuzna. Hank's dad Gus is there too, and not only is he a bit of an anti-Semite, Kim's Jewish. Hmm. Jesus. But, in keeping with this movie's half-baked themes, he also shares his misogynistic views on gender roles. Well, I think a woman's place is in the home raising a family. Don't you just love the holidays? Kim is still mad at Hank for not sticking up for her at work, and not even his leather jacket can make her feel better about it. So she leaves him in anger and heads home, where she sees more faces, this time in her blinds. I guess we can add pareidolia to the things this movie wants to half-acidly touch on. Since Kim didn't bother cleaning her apartment before she left, she finds that one of those cockroaches she saw has grown to full-on Gregor Samsa size. I guess that's what happens when you leave your spaghetti hands out. The disgusting roach hangs out on her wall while Kim throws up in the toilet, vomiting out spaghetti sauce and a, uh, bug, I guess, before passing out on the bathroom floor. The next day, Kim goes to a park to meet Fima for that picnic. And, you know, there's nothing like the warm embrace of a stranger you just met at a bookstore the day before. Kim meets Fima's female friend group, including Catherine, Jane, and, of course, Ms. Merlot. They chat about the lady who burnt up, with Jane off offering some strange commentary about the victim. She wasn't strong enough. Even though they're obviously lying, like, look at FEMA's lying face, the ladies all profess not to know who the victim was. They wish Kim luck with her job and toast to her health. All that wine has left Kim like a widow sweepy baby, and FEMA takes advantage of her with some light lesbianism that, uh, wait, what's going on here? Did she just put a spell on her or something? I don't really know, but look at those tree branches. It's another face. Get the face, Kim. Hank shows up out of nowhere and takes Kim's drunk ass back to work, where Eli has decided to put her on the spontaneous combustion story thanks to Hank's influence. Kim heads over to FEMA's apartment, where I think Neith Hunter forgot her line and had to have Maude Adams feed it to her. So you see? You have to be careful of what you want because you, you might, might just, just get, get it. Get it. It's true. Oof, I do not think it was scripted that way, but this movie can't afford second takes. FEMA gives Kim some coffee, but not before sprinkling some glitter in it that she calls Elderbark. Mmm, Elderbark. It immediately gets Kim feeling a little woozy here, man. So she's unable to pay a lot of attention as FEMA talks about her daughter that died in an accident and how she blames her ex-husband for everything that happened. As Kim gets drowsier, FEMA's attitude towards her veers wildly, from sapphic interest to motherly discipline. <laughs> Now look what you've done. To grandmotherly dried fruit offering. And even after that date transmutates into a cockroach, Kim listens to her lover mother grandmama and eats that buggy up. Before you know it, she's having stomach cramps and hallucinatory flashbacks to stuff we've already seen in this movie. So hey, I guess this is a Silent Night Deadly Night after all. Jane and another of FEMA's diversity squad friends suddenly appear overhead and, with Kim all rosemaried up from the drugs, strip off her clothes and mark her forehead with some, uh, soot? Paint? I don't know. Whatever it is, it's great for ring around the navel, Ricky enters the room to insist that Kim take his Christmas gift, and after an ambiguous spoken spell, Earth to Earth, Mother 
daughter. The creature is put on top of Kim's belly button swirl. Then they cut open an adorable little mole, and yeah, I don't really know what's happening anymore, but Kim looked like she needs some Pepto-Bismol. She ends up vomiting out a giant cockroach that is also like a millipede? Dude, what the fuck is up with this movie and these nasty goddamn bugs? Oh, and then they go and cut it in half? <laughs> oh my god, it looks like one of those cheap popper firework things on the inside. <laughs> anyway, Ricky uses the bug innards to give Kim a facial. Sorry, that's what it looks like! And then she passes out. When she wakes up a little bit later, the ladies all surround her, and FEMA tells her exactly what she wants. I want my daughter back. But Kim didn't sign up to be no lady's daughter or nothing, so she takes off running. She goes to Hank's apartment and wakes him up out of bed, then starts freaking the fuck out entirely, and even tries to swallow a bunch of pills before he's able to stop her. Next thing you know, though, she's on top of him in bed, and getting pretty weird with her dirty talk. I wanna fuck you while you're sleeping. Hey. What? Would that even work? Before she can satisfy her narcophilia, Ricky walks into the apartment and straight into the bedroom, where he then decides to sit on the bed and watch TV. What you watching there, Rick? Wait, what? No fucking- wait, what the fuck? Santa Claus killer! This is like a whole new level of flashback fuckery, so uh, good job I guess? Ricky throws Hank aside and tells Kim it's time to go, but Hank hits him with a lamp and the two of them get into a fight. After a couple of belly prods and a beat down with a broomstick, Ricky gains the upper hand by biting into Hank's upper foot. Then he takes a kitchen knife and tells Hank to leave him alone Don't fuck with me. before stabbing the poor dude a few times in the chest in a pretty sadistic way. Something about that nonchalant stabbing really upsets me. Eventually, as Kim watches from beneath the bed, Ricky finishes Hank off with a death that's mostly off screen but still pretty effective thanks to all the blood flowing to the ground and the nasty sound effects. <laughs> Yuck. Plus, the body falls in front of Kim, confirming the kill for us, and, as far as Ricky is concerned, ending the sequence. Come on out now! Kim's co-worker Janice comes into the apartment, but she's not surprised to find Ricky there. Turns out she's part of the witch conspiracy too! She helps Kim out of her bondage and tells her that she needs to go with Ricky and finish what started in FEMA's apartment. Man, this is such a Rosemary's Baby ripoff, it's ridiculous. Ricky sticks Kim in the freezer of that Asian guy's meat store, where FEMA and her femme crew are waiting to sit Kim down in a chair and get her body ready for Ricky and his eyes wide shut get up. Things get real nasty real fast, as all the women oil up Clint Howard's naked body like he's Steve Christie, and then he proceeds to rape Kim while the witches all laugh. Ooh, boy. Kim wakes up later in Neath Hunter's like 10th nude scene in the movie, only this time she's got some real freaky jeeky hands and she's a uh, oh, oh god, what, what the fuck? What are we doing here? And oh my god, now she's like a weird mermaid? Or a bug? More bugs? Yo, I don't even know what's happening anymore, man. All I know is that Hank's body is hanging out there Hellraiser style. The next morning, Kim wakes up again with her legs in some kind of exoskeleton, and the meat shop owner walks in to explain what happened to her in that forced broken English of his. You have been initiated. You go. Now. Kim goes to the bookstore where the movie just all of a sudden decides to solve the mystery of the falling flaming lady. Yes. She was my daughter. But now FEMA has Kim to be her new daughter and join their she-woman man-hating club. She tells Kim that they want her to kidnap Hank's little brother Lonnie for some kind of anti-penis magic sacrifice, but Kim doesn't want anything to do with it and runs away from them. Kim has a cop played by Not Ed Harris investigate Hank's apartment, but since it was cleaned by Janice, he doesn't find any evidence of a struggle. He does, however, find a <gasps> prescription bottle behind the mirror? Wow, must be one of them psycho bitches, huh? Kim goes to her work's holiday party, but can't even pretend to be normal after Janice smooches on her and repeats FEMA's talking points. Now, you have to bring us the boy. That's not a fun work holiday party at all. Where's the engaging conversation? You know, stuff like this. Thinking about my parents. Oh, good, good. Good, that's, that's fine, that's fine, that's fine. They're dead. Oh. Kim leaves that lame-ass work party and finds herself being followed by Ricky, who forces her to take refuge inside a motel room. The TV programming at the motel consists of lesbian porn on Channel 2, and on Channel 7, FEMA telling Kim to bring them the boy. This lack of cable television gives Kim an upset stomach, so she tries to make herself feel better with a shower. But Kim, you forgot about those firecracker ankle bracelets you put on that morning. You know, the kind that go off when they get wet. Anyway, her flaming legs are enough to make her give up right in the rick of time. <laughs> Ricky drives Kim to Hank's family's house, where inside, Lonnie gets a pretty sweet Christmas gift. A frickin' Tommy Jarvis jacket. Hell yeah! He answers the door for Kim, whose shitty lie apparently works on the young lad. Hank's not with you, is he? Sure he is. He's out in the car. Do you want to come out and talk to him? I knew it! The kid's even dumber after they get inside the Stranger Danger van, and he continues to buy Kim's bullshit about Hank not being there. Where is he? Um, he 
he'll be right back. So what do you want for Christmas? Huh, I want my fucking brother, lady. Bring him out. Because we need another body for the kill count, Ricky enters Hank's family's house to attack the parents. He tapes up Hank's mom off screen and then tackles Gus by the Christmas tree, where he strangles him to death with the Christmas lights, just like Billy Chapman did back when he was kicking off his own killing spree. And they say these movies aren't connected. Although Gus's kill sets the house on fire and Ricky abandons it to get back in the van as Kim drives away, I won't count the mom as a death because it's unconfirmed as hell. Deal with it. The coven meets on that same old tie town rooftop, this time with a tween boy tied up with a shirt ripped open. What are you doing? I've been asking that this whole damn movie, kid. FEMA tells Kim that she needs to kill Lonnie because reasons, and then it's back with the bug shit again. Oh, that one kind of looked like a toothbrush, cool. Despite the ladies cranking their misandry levels up to 11, kill the man. <laughs> Woman. Kim's unable to bring herself to kill Lonnie, and instead, when FEMA tries to force her hand, she drives the knife into FEMA's stomach, piercing the coven supreme and allowing her to free Lonnie from his restraints. FEMA takes the knife out and approaches Kim with hatred in her eyes, but that's when Ricky decides to have a heart. No, man. Don't hurt her. Of course, that just gets him his very own stab to the gut, made more intense when FEMA drags the knife up and slits his chest open. Ouch! Then after he falls to the ground, he gets, what, eaten by bugs? <laughs> okay, sure. Kim has more killer cramps, and FEMA kneels down next to her to say she's been a bad girl. Looks like her punishment is to have her hands get real crazy spindly and then just spontaneously combust. That's been a recurring thing in this movie, sure. But Kim just uses her new flaming appendage to stab FEMA in the gut again, which causes the head witch to light up completely in an obvious fire stunt, my fucking favorite. FEMA runs away from Kim and straight off the edge of the roof, dying against the sidewalk in a mere kill of her daughter's death that kicked this whole thing off. Only this time, the flames actually cover the entire body. Kim stares down the other ladies like, yeah, get some witches, and leaves them behind without a leader, then takes Lonnie and tells him that everything's gonna be okay now. You know, except for the fact that your brother and dad are dead. Oh, and maybe your mom too. Merry Christmas! How many kills did this unrelated witch-tastic sequel will give us. Let's find out and get to the numbers. Oh, this looks tasty. Was this a little date? Nope, that's a bug. That's, that's a plastic bug. Five people died in Silent Night, Deadly Night 4. The victims consisted of two women and three dirty, awful men. I'm just kidding. I was being the witches from the movie, who, let's not forget, were characters written by dudes. With a runtime of 86 minutes, we wound up with a kill on average every 17.2 minutes. I'll give the golden chainsaw for coolest kill to Hank, which is probably one of the most off-screen deaths to ever get the award. But his earlier stabbings in the kitchen feel really intense to me, and even his ultimately off-screen death is effectively shot from Kim's perspective under the bed. Good stuff. Doll Machete for lamest kill will go to Gus, since we already saw that shit in the first one, and because he makes a goofy face while he goes. And that's it. Silent Night Deadly Night 4, Initiation, was written and directed by Brian Usna and hit that straight-to-video market in 1990. The next sequel, Part 5 The Toy Maker, would actually involve Christmas again, but I'll show you that next week. Until then, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. Thanks a lot for watching this week's Kill Count. I want to thank a couple of patrons like Dan Patelski, Alex Rogers, Fenris Marodane, and Clyde. Let me know in the comments if you had actually known about and watched this movie before. As fun as this one is, next week's is even more fun. Trust me, Silent Night Deadly Night 5 is the sleeper hit of this franchise. And get ready for Sunday's video. Y'all gonna love it. Thanks a lot, y'all. Be good people.